second. Wanna... I like it says recording in progress is the last nine minutes of things that we had done right. were going to be. <laughs> they, they, those, right. those, those weren't important. <laughs> so, so for those of you who don't already know us, my name is Alex Farling. I'm one of the co-founders here at Lifecycle Insights. Um, and my esteemed colleague is, is going to go ahead and introduce herself as well. I'm Marnie Stockman, I'm CEO of Lifecycle Insights. Like Alex said, um, we are co-founders. Um, so I ran customer success for a large ed tech company, and Alex was an MSP. And like um, Reese's peanut butter, um, where chocolate and peanut butter go better together, um, we, we almost literally ran into each other on the volleyball court, but <laughs> usually we've been playing together long enough that we managed not yeah. to do that on the usual. Um, but the conversation started on a volleyball court of, hey, we have done our fair share of business reviews in the ed tech space. Uh, the developers and I know data analytics and how to develop reports for um, teachers and students. And Alex said, oh, then I bet you could build them for execs as well. And I spent eight hours today cobbling together industry term, my business review. Is that something we could look into? And that's really... Um, how it came to be. So pardon me, three years ago, Alex taught me what the letters RMM, PSA, MSP, ISP, VAR, <laughs> et cetera, meant, uh, and Lifecycle Insights became a thing. So um, do, do you want to spent talk the last about three years learning from MSPs uh, that, that had similar but different problems to mine, um, and we've just continued to build and improve on, on the product from there. And really with two key elements, right? You're the first pain that you felt was it took eight hours. So pain one, we should be able to automate this stuff. And when you started throwing out all of these different tools that they came from, it was obvious we needed one place to aggregate it. The second piece you mentioned was, I'm not sure it's accurate and I'm not sure it's pretty, right? It takes a long time to make it pretty. So we wanted to make for ease of use for reporting. And then lastly, you said it takes even longer to connect the dots for strategy. And I think that is the piece that, well, for you have a huge background in sales, but it was always around the solving the pain, not pushing FUD, right? Well, let's be clear. You know, there's the technical strategy, right? Which is, might be really technical. Um, FUD is a whole other thing. But when you, when you really want to walk, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in removing the obstacle and convincing the customer that the yes was their idea, right? Pushy sales just feels grimy. It feels gross. Nobody likes to do it. And I've sat with so many MSPs over the last three years that have just said, your sales process is super laid back. Like I never feel gross doing it. I feel like I can just go in and have a conversation and the documents lead to the purchase. And that was the purpose. It was, it was present the information in a way that we've kind of put it together in the right order. We've structured the talking points. We the, the conversation literally walks itself through the path of the customer going, you know, I feel like if I spent some money, I could make that problem go away. And we're having customers, MSPs come back to us in droves now telling us that, you know, they just don't have to sell anymore. Yeah. And they can just go have a conversation, that consultative conversation with their customer. And, you know, that really separates what we're doing here from the folks who are building you a sales platform somewhere trying to teach you how to sell things. Absolutely. And I think the whole notion of driving business outcomes with technology solutions is what MSPs thrive on um, and really help grow and scale their business. So with that intro, hopefully that speaks to folks in the room. We're going to show you Lifecycle Insights and how we help do those three things we just talked about. So if you did not come to the party for that, then you know feel free to go grab lunch or, or whatever yeah. time zone you're in the appropriate meal. <clears throat> But that's what we thought we were here to talk about today. So I'm going to show my screen and um, dive into Lifecycle Insights. So while you're playing along at home, feel free to use chat and QA. Um, and I'm going to have Alex type some of the elements that we talk about in the chat because we typically get a lot of uh, questions around this. Um, he and I both know we speak quickly and we're both working to uh, make it more consumable. But the beginning part is we require a primary integration and I'm gonna spew them off quickly, but Alex will type them into the chat for me, please. Um, so we start with an integration with either ConnectWise Manage, Datto Autotask, Halo, Synchro, or IT Glue. 
I typed we, faster than you talked for once, and that's okay. weird. Well, that's I'm intentionally not not blabbering on. There you go. Um, so so we start with that to grab your companies, your contacts, and your assets. We're going to go grab that. You can see I've got my company creative designs on the dashboard, but I could easily switch and find out what Get Well Medical Services looks like. And we give you a data quality score. So right out of the gate, we're solving one of Alex's problems where he wasn't sure if he was including all of the assets that he in fact knew about for the company on their budget forecast, which we were aiming to deliver. We improve the data with warranty lookups. So I suspect you're typing these too. So we do warranty lookups on Dell, Lenovo, HP, Microsoft Surface, Cisco, Meraki, and SmartNet. So this is aiming to close the gaps on the assets that were maybe missing a purchase date or a warranty date. And our goal for that is to deliver an asset list. Now, this is your asset lifecycle management inventory. If you're following any of the cybersecurity frameworks, NIST, CMMC, CIS, you know, any of the three letter names to be named later, um, it's one of the basic components of all of the frameworks. Are you, in fact, confident that you are accurately inventorying the assets you have? The reason for this is the assets that you're not inventorying are typically the ones that are either old operating systems, out of date, can't be patched, and therefore security concerns and frankly, productivity concerns. So asset inventory is key. Um, one of the things about Lifecycle Insights, and I was just showing this to someone earlier and he said, oh man, that's so much better than my Excel spreadsheet. So we have the notion of swatching. So we've got um, red, yellow, green, uh, typical stoplight reporting and blue for unknown. And if I want to find all of my assets where my operating system has expired, I can swatch away the colors I don't want to see. So now I'm left with the six Windows um, expired assets. I can click on all of these, choose an action, and create a recommendation from here. We're going to talk about recommendations in a minute, but the recommendation is where you're going to help to connect the dots for your clients between the technical needs, which is what Alex was talking about, and the strategic reason why we're solving that problem for them. Similar to this, we um, have a user list. Now the user list right out of the gate um, starts with the PSA integration and also with API um, pull from Microsoft 365 itself. Here folks ask questions like, where are there folks not in my PSA, so red, but green, they do have an active Microsoft 365 license. More to the point, this column turns red when they haven't logged in in over 30 days. And this one turns red if MFA is disabled. So here, the conversation quickly becomes one around security and potentially cost savings for your clients, potentially new sales for you. There are three things to ask yourself here. First, do they have a license and we didn't know about that user and we're charging per user and we need to collect some more revenue from them? Second, should these licenses not exist at all and we can save our clients some money? And third, are these licenses that are languishing out there that nobody's logged into, in fact, security concerns because you know passwords and usernames are out in the world somewhere and we're not managing them. So this is a good place to start. We have additional integrations that can feed this report. So we have integrations with a couple cybersecurity phishing training tools, Breach Secure Now and Know Before. We also have integrations with Augment and as of this weekend, Saslio, which are SAS monitoring tools. So I can click on this gear. And if I had Breach Secure Now clients, this would auto-populate as on, but we, we hide it for the beginning. And here I can see who my Breach Secure Now partners are, what their latest ESS, you know, employee secure score and phishing fail rate were. All of those reports that I just mentioned to you also have standalone reports. So we've got Microsoft Secure Score, once again, in an attempt to convince clients that MFA needs to happen. 
I've got a standalone breach secure now report. The no before one is very comparable. It's like delivering the high level information across all your companies along with individual user detail. In Augment, Augment and Sasleo have similar data. Sasleo has a few additional reports. Here we can get a view of um, critical apps as well as user details. So who is using risky apps or um, you know, productivity apps, et cetera. So, and then the last uh, more report that we have is uh, ticketing dashboard. So if you are a manage or Halo part, I'm oh, sorry, manage or auto task partner, we have the ability to drive um, an overview of ticketing. One of the things that Alex and I talked about at the beginning of Lifecycle Insights is um, how to have a bad QBR. And we both agree that if it turns into a list of um, tickets and a ticket autopsy of all of them, it's not strategic. It's definitely painful. And it definitely means your client probably does not want to come back for another one. The only time we would talk about tickets and QBRs is to give an overall summary that it was healthy. And maybe if I looked at this particular one, if I didn't know that Alex Farling was the project manager who was submitting all of the tickets, if I thought he was a pesky user who had struggles, I might want to go take a look at his devices to see if there was a problem there, or maybe he needed some training, right? If every one of these tickets closed with, can you log out and log back in? <laughs> we, maybe we can put a, a post-it note on his computer. Right. <laughs> well, and, and the other thing is, if you see a big uh, swath of tickets coming from a line of business application or printers or something like that, it may be that there are some technical realignment, some training, some configuration that can be done that reduces the number of tickets, makes your client happier, makes you more profitable, and it's just a win-win for everybody. So looking at these from a high level, super valuable. I love what Kevin Elsing says. You know, if you get into a, a conversation about SLAs, you're having a service level argument and yeah. you've already lost. You've already right? lost. If you're, yeah. <laughs> you're down in the weeds, you've just you've just already lost. Yeah. Um, I did throw in chat as well, um, Smileback as an integration is coming this yeah. weekend. That is not in here. I typed it in in the chat, but I wanted everybody to hear that. Um, we will have a, an extra report in this category Category to show you smile back uh, results as well. And we'll be adding some more uh, products around that, uh, th that CSAT function later in the year. Absolutely. I say later in the year, we're pretty late in the year. So um, <laughs> we are, but be, our developers uh, are pretty amazing. Yeah. So we yeah. switch to that, that, that still can be very true. <laughs> Correct. Um, along, the, so I'm still on the automation path. Uh, we and I, I just yeah. realized I've been responding to everyone's questions in hosts and panelists as opposed to to everyone. So I've done a terrible job by you guys. And I'm going to go back and repost a bunch of stuff that I've been typing into chat um, to make sure that you get it all. So bear with me. Um, thank you so much, Matt, for uh, for catching me on that, because you guys have been talking away and I've been talking back and I've been very ineffective. So here we go. I'll, I'll put it all back together. So if you are a manage or auto task partner, we have the ability to import your contracts or in manage terminology or agreements and additions, uh, or you can manually add them. Many folks do both, and here is why. To be able to drive a budget forecast that doesn't just talk about the services you deliver to your partner, but all of their technology services is a powerful and strategic conversation to have. Uh, Alex and I regularly see an MSP Geek channel or our Facebook group, somebody saying it was a mic drop moment when I was able to deliver a five-year budget forecast to my clients, not just for my services, but their line of business application, um, you know, maybe their printer copier services, their phone services, et cetera. Not only is it strategic for your partner who appreciates this level of reporting, but for yourself, to get insights into when their VoIP services are um, expiring so that you could maybe get in and say, hey, would you like to take a look at our VoIP provider? Um, we'd be able to save you some money on this, et cetera. One of our partners happily talks about how he's actually doing this now for prospects. And he found one very large prospect that had 17 different phone providers. And he was able to eliminate $3,000 of MRR for them he sold them his services, his VoIP provider, and is getting a kickback on that. And then his $4,000 MRR client seemed, uh, you know, was more than happy to pay his bill, realizing the partnership that they had created. So that's the last component that will push on to a budget forecast. So our budget forecast has a lot of flexibility. 
This includes all of the expired assets that we showed on the asset list, shows any of the contracts that are coming up, along with any recommendations. <clears throat> I'm going to dive more into the recommendations, but the beauty of this is I can really get any level of detail. I can build this to be monthly, quarterly, or yearly up to 12 cycles. Majority of our partners do a short-term tactical budget, right? 12 month, every asset that's going to be replaced. So you can tell all the humans that are going to be impacted when they are going to, you know, be handed a new device. And then also a three or five year more wide angle guest budget. That is more for not blindsiding them when you're going to tell them in two years that they have two servers still, right? If you can start budgeting for them, um, typically, even though your clients are paying for managed services and they understand you are not a break fix shop. They still think about your meetings that look like sales calls as break fix. Like I'm constantly being surprised by new projects. If you can start projecting these into the future, it's much more strategic and they're much more likely to have this conversation with you and appreciate the budget. So Alex, I know you're super passionate about the, the total cost of ownership budgeting component are there other pieces or are you still, I see many, many chats. Many, many chat. chats. Well, most of those are my fault because I had to do them all twice. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, I mean, my big thing on total cost of ownership budgeting is really just around the delivery, right? When I would go to a customer and say, hey, I need you to spend $40,000 on X, Y, or Z. Um, and, and it was a surprise conversation. They were really unhappy about it. Um, sometimes I'd go in and try and sell a project and I'd feel like the client's nodding along. They're right. They get it. They understand why. And at the end they go, yeah, I get it. But just not the right time for that. Thanks. Please go away. And, you know, the budget really opens up a different conversation. It's part of the, what I mentioned earlier in the, in the conversation, in the call, which is our goal is to get our customer to decide that they should spend money instead of trying to sell them something. And part of that is laying the budget out in front of them, laying a recommendation out alongside of it and saying, when does it make sense for you to address this risk that lives in your environment? Because, you know, until we do something about it, it exists. And when they can see that chunk of overdue stuff, right, this debt snowball that's that's kind of piling up on the left, and they can see every month and every quarter and every year coming in the future, they can see this debt snowball is not going anywhere. In fact, it just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling and getting bigger and bigger. And eventually they're going to have to spend the money where when the budget's not in front of them, psychologically, people think they can just not, you know, just not click shop, not click buy in the Amazon cart and it doesn't cost me any money. Right. But IT is like groceries. Like you have to eat. You have to spend the money at some point. Just because I don't go to the grocery store, just because I don't spend $500 at the grocery store all at once, doesn't mean I'm not going to spend $500 throughout the month feeding myself. And IT is the same way. Like we're going to, it's pay me now or pay me later. And the budget really lays it out and makes common sense of it for folks. It makes it easier for customers to say yes, because they know when the next surprise is coming, right? We used to go knock, knock, surprise, I need money. Um, that was kind of the calling card of the MSP for years and years and years. And we're getting better about that. I think that's the powerful piece, right? The power to say yes, to, to give them permission to meet with you because otherwise it's kind of clinchy. Like, I'm like, Alex is calling again. Why is it going to be an expense? Or like, no, you know, we're going to have these strategic conversations. Um, which leads me to the next piece, which is around how do we build the conversations to be strategic? So I like to draw a dark line in the sand here to say this <clears> is <throat> the automation. I consider the magic on the platform side ends. And this is when it leads into the magic of the MSP, really, because this is about digging into what an MSP knows about their clients or their prospects. So I'm going to dig into the assessment piece. Again, this is not a network detector type of tool. We don't have agents on machines. This is a, these are survey questions or questionnaires that you would ask your clients, maybe with them, maybe by yourself, maybe with your engineering team, et cetera, to determine the risk so that um, we can align recommendations to how we need to help their clients achieve their business outcomes and be more secure. If you come from another assessment platform, we can certainly import your assessment into our platform. If you have one in an Excel spreadsheet, we could import that as well. Um, or you could use one of our default templates or a combo platter of both. Many folks start with, take a look at our default assessments and then dive in and edit it to make it their own, which we highly recommend. Everybody has their you know, specific standards and strategies to use. So you should incorporate that into the questions you ask your clients. I will speak to two of our popular assessments. 
The first is the top of the list. Um, uh, we're friends with the folks at Fifth Wall Cybersecurity Liability Insurance Company, who has aggregated 35 different cyber insurance carrier forms. So to fill this out for your clients is a good starting point to see you know, how they're feeling about cybersecurity liability insurance moving forward. The second is the one that I'm actually going to dive into, which is our default assessment. And this is a category-based assessment that will drive questions around hardware, software, line of business application, um, et cetera. So as I'm in the assessment, a couple things are apparent. First, in a not so surprising turn of events, red, yellow, green, stoplight reporting, right? You can easily just check the box of where the, where the partner or prospect is uh, and leave a comment for what, what you would do to remediate this. I have said a few times that you can use this for prospects as well. When you purchase Lifecycle Insights, it's based on number of active clients in the platform. And we have a free trial for five act, up to five active clients. We always recommend starting there and growing as you go. But the assessment portion is free. So as long as you have a, a, tri, you know, a subscription for five active clients, you can do the assessment piece on all prospects and all of the rest of your clients. Now, some of you might be paying for an assessment platform and wondering why we're giving away the same thing that you're paying for elsewhere. It is because we believe that the assessments really help drive your business and the right business conversations. So if you drive your business, first, those prospects will turn into clients. So it's building your business, which will grow our business. But more to the point, it makes sense to have the data in the same place. So once they become your client, you can show growth over time. And then that last piece, to be able to show them uh, their growth over time and how part your process, the same process they see in the sales processes, what it looks like to work with you, right? So as part of your QBR process. It would be really um, idiotic of us to stand up in front of MSPs all day and say, we'll show you how to grow your, your uh, relationship with your existing clients. Uh, we'll show you how to be frictionless to work with. We'll show you how to to deliver real customer success and be customer champions and for us not to treat you the same way. So I think you'll find that we're, we try very hard to be one of the easiest vendors in the channel to work with. Uh, if you don't find working with us to be frictionless, jump up and down and yell and scream because because uh, we will feel like we have failed you, right? 100%, yeah. Um, I, I did pull up the pricing package so you could see what I'm talking about. Everything we're talking about today is on this left-hand side in the VCIO package. And I mentioned we have free 30-day trial for five or 25 active customers. Um, as you scale up, we can grow from here. And if you have more than 200 active clients, it's another $150 for every 100 clients. I mentioned at the beginning that we do warranty lookups. So we also have a standalone or an add-on package. That's this right one that is for asset insight reporting. So that's just the warranty lookup asset list. It's the single that asset reporting. Uh, and the piece here is some folks, that's unlimited clients, unlimited users, et cetera, unlimited assets for 79 a month. Some folks say, well, I want the VCIO package for my five biggest clients to start, but my other 35 clients, I need to do asset lifecycle management. So they add that on until they scale up the full VCIO package. Once everybody's in the VCIO package, you don't need the error anymore because that's included. And then we'll talk about customer success for a minute at the end, but I don't wanna confuse things yet, but it is an add-on module that requires the VCIO piece. So back to assessments. Some of the features of assessments that are really that's really powerful the ability to show previous responses. So if Alex assessed this client last time and I've taken over the account for him, I can see that he made a note to encourage iPads. So um, he wanted to throw out the Chromebooks and encourage iPads. So that was part of the conversation. And I know that and I can score appropriately. You can also include scoring instructions and explanation remediation tips. Alex and I work with new customer success managers all of the time, and we have found that the ability to uh, have a scalable process so that new customer success managers can follow the same scoring and remediation tips that the rest of their team does um, is very powerful. As a matter of fact, I have quite a few 
owners who are trying to hand off the work of building a prepping for a business review to a new customer success manager. And they've recorded themselves talking through building the assessment and they have the new customer success manager create the documentation in the platform for how to score and what explanation remediation tips to give along the way. You might see some green buttons about our platform. We have them kind of all over the place where you can create a PSA ticket. So if you are a manage or an auto task partner, you can click create PSA ticket and it'll automatically kick off the place where the project team, the techs are going to actually work on whatever the problem is. Once you've completed a, an assessment, the report comes out looking like this for the client. So to be able to say easily in the categories we've talked about, your hardware and security posture are at risk, they're red, right? Business continuity and business application software in the yellow, policy and procedures not looking good, and um, the strategy that was involved is around a 50%. This gives you an overall assessment score. What we recommend doing, either with prospects or from one business review to the next, is to give your initial assessment on where you are now and then score it again as though they have accepted all the recommendations that you're making. And when you do that, we have a comparison report. So I can show them, okay, we, I did your initial assessment and then I scored it again. And you were originally at a 36% for your technology health. And just onboarding with us, we'd move the needle to an 83%, right? To have the conversation around health and how as things age out, these will ebb and flow, but we're always gonna work to improve your security posture along the way. They'll say, great, how would we do that? At that point, you would be able to show them the recommendations you've made. And I'm gonna show you how you can build a recommendation. So I can take a look by category at all of my scores and where I'm at risk. And I might say, I wanna solve these three problems with a single recommendation. So I select them and create a recommendation. If this screen looks familiar, it's the same one I grabbed from the asset side. This time I'm gonna actually add some assets to the list. So I'm gonna say, we're gonna solve these problems of, with your hardware by eliminating all of these assets that have expired operating systems. When I bundle this together, it all lands as a recommendation on my roadmap for clients. So now when I go into my recommendation board, I can see I've lined up some recommendations that are not scheduled yet, and I can drag and drop them to the quarter that makes sense for clients. You can filter this by tag. So if you've filtered by, you know, these are proposed, these are the ones you've accepted, or a lot of folks have asked us to include declined, which we do, so that you can track. These are all the ones you've declined over time, and, you know, let's talk again about the risks associated with those particular recommendations that you haven't opted to do. I'm going to show two more pieces, and hopefully Alex says, I see lots of chats again, so we'll answer any of the questions out loud that for the sake of the recording that we may want, and any other questions that folks have along the way. <clears throat> First piece is looking at our scheduler. So our scheduler is just a view in Lifecycle Insights. It's not associated to your calendar, um, but this really lets you segment your client base into who you wanna meet with monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, annually, et cetera. It is also the place where you document your business review. So from here, after I've set my cadence, I can associate the on-site contacts to that. Um, I can create my meeting notes. I can upload artifacts. And inside the meeting notes, I can create a ticket for each note that requires follow-up. We have MSPs tell us all the time, we're great at selling projects. We're not so great about following up on all of the little I dotting and T crossing that happened after the, um, the business review. So this is the place to do that and make sure that those follow-ups happen. The goal of Lifecycle Insights from the outset, Alex wanted an easy button that he could click and automatically generate a business review client over client that was consistent, looked good, was strategic. 
So we have the notion of a report builder. I've grabbed my favorite template, but you could probably see from that scrolling list that you can have unlimited number of templates uh, and you can build your own. We have some folks that have a smaller version. So they do sort of mini reviews, either monthly or quarterly, and then have a large annual one. It's really up to you. We don't believe a platform should force a process on you, but should support your process. We do have default settings for those folks saying, hey, I need you to tell me what my process should be. If that's where you are, we absolutely can help you with our defaults and get you going forward on that. But you can see on the left-hand side, I have stacked a lot of the components that are already in the platform. So you can see that these are the same reports um, you know, that I just walked through, but I've already set them. I've already set, I want a five-year budget, a six-quarter budget. I want my assets that are nearing warranty, expiration, et cetera. I want my recommendation roadmap. I can print this out so I can download this. It downloads to Word or PDF as of this weekend. So we're excited about that. Um, or you can put it into presentation mode. And presentation mode means that if you've been cutting and pasting things into PowerPoint slides, you no longer have to do that because you can just do it live right within the platform and have the conversation with your client and still dive in if they have questions. So if I'm in the budget forecast and they say, what are those two workstations that are overdue? I can just dive in and check it out. So before I take a look at our second module for just a minute, I wanna answer any questions we have on the VCIO side of the house so that we understand everything that goes with VCIO. So Alex, you wanna give me a summary of the 35 chats that we've been having and are any of them things we still need to discuss? Uh, no. Uh, so the one I do want to address is, is Apple warranty lookups. So uh, folks are asking if we do Apple warranty lookups and Apple has closed down that that function. Um, <clears throat> the folks that are that are trying to do Apple warranty lookups, the common way to fake their way through it is by trying to guesstimate purchase date based on either model info or based on um, the serial number and being able to peel the serial number apart and find an underlying date code in the serial number. Um, that takes no... Uh, um, it doesn't take into account uh, new devices that have new serial numbers that don't uh, that aren't handled that way. It doesn't take into account if an extended warranty was purchased. Um, they're just not able to get that data because Apple has no real API for it. And we know that because we've been sending Apple a monthly email for almost three years now. Uh, and they keep telling us that they will provide us with more detail in a month. Um, we've talked to everyone from Adigee who I think knows Apple better than all of us, uh, up to you know some of the RMM vendors and some of those folks who are trying to pull off these same kind of things. And Apple has just shut down the program and is not letting anyone else back into it. Perfect. So that's all. So otherwise we're good on questions. Yeah. Yep. Jim says we're putting out the right kind of short-term video topics. I would tell you that's because these are based on questions other MSPs are asking. So you're in the same... Uh, and in the same boat as a lot of other folks out there. So take that uh, to heart. Yeah, if folks haven't found our YouTube channel, for sure, highly recommend. We have um, Friday weekly workshops that we publish with our partners. And last week, it was really an assortment of questions that people had submitted in kind of an Ask Me Anything format for our partners, not just for us. Um, so there are a lot of good topics in our, in our channel. Um, and the short clips that are going out are about little three-minute bite-sized pieces of how to do the different um, pieces of the platform, different features and functions. So again, me and my drawing dark signs in this, um, dark lines in the sand, right? We've talked through the automation. We've talked through how we make it strategic by aligning a budget with the recommendations, et cetera. Now I'm going to show you just a couple bite-sized pieces of our customer success platform. So if you have run into us in, at an event, then for sure we tried to hand you one of the books because we wrote the book on customer success for MSPs, literally. And in that, we talk through customer success uh, and really some strategies that the SaaS world has used, but MSPs did not have any tools for tracking this. So I mentioned at the beginning of the call that I came from the world of customer success in an enterprise um, ed tech platform where we were constantly tracking adoption, customer health, trying to get insights into churn, opportunities, um, and really happy, healthy clients. So that is the same thing that we were aiming to do with this platform. 
Um, but different than the SaaS world is that we needed to integrate with the PSA, which is what the other tools out there did not do. So we have done that. Looking at this screen, I'm actually going to take us into another screen that has a larger version of that same chart. The first thing we're going to take a look at is customer segments. And with customer segments, we're looking at their value, so MRR or MRR per seat, if you prefer, versus their effort. Now, we automate based on tickets per seat, but some folks prefer to enter a manual score or they use a combination of scores like location, um, number of um, uh, servers that they have, right? Like there are lots of other things that might make them more complex that you can put into the calculation. But the goal is to take a look at the quadrants and say my top right quadrant, high value, high effort. They Marnie, probably, before you before you run too far down here, can you just show yeah. the module picker at the top? Matt's asking where he can see yeah. this screen. So yeah. Matt, this is part of the customer success module. So it is an additional bill for the stuff that we're talking about at this point. Everything we talked about in the beginning is the VCIO module. So if you don't see the module picker with, uh, with several options up there, you might only see assessment only in VCIO, then those are just the modules that you've purchased. This is that, that fourth customer success module on her screen. Yep. <clears throat> so you only see VCIO because you haven't registered any customers for for um, for assessment only, um, and it means you haven't tried the, the uh, customer success module. If you want the customer success module, we can get you a free trial of it. And you can check it out. Uh, for yeah, if you go and days. upgrade, it'll automatically add the add it as a free yep. trial. And when she gets done here, she'll show you where to upgrade. Yep. Um, so the notion here is in my quadrants, this top right quadrant would be, these are the folks I need to meet with quarterly or monthly, right? Again, we don't mandate a process. We just give you the tools to determine um, how yours fits into here. Uh, bottom right, high value, low effort. So these are probably your most profitable. If I had somebody whose health score was red in this bottom right quadrant, I'd be all over fixing that. Bottom left, um, low value, low effort. You might think, why do I keep those? Well, because these are on autopilot, right? So they're probably a decent profit margin. Uh, and frankly, they may be the ones that are growing and will slowly move to the right. Uh, and you should think about what we call these high touch, mid touch, tech touch, right? These are your tech touch folks. So you should have a, an automated marketing cadence to them um, about what they, you know, what you're delivering for them or what other ways you can help. Top left, high effort, low value. So we either need to renegotiate and have them pay us more so they move to the right. We need to figure out why they are um, so much effort. Are there expired assets that are causing lag time and productivity, et cetera? Is there something we can do to fix that? Some trainings we can do to move them down or are they the few that we need to fire? I was interesting, I helped somebody um, look at theirs the other day. She logged in and saw it for the first time and she hovered over the first person that she saw in the top left quadrant. And she said, oh, I hate that customer. Yeah, that's probably because they're the largest pain, right? And so we all know who should land here, but she said, that's a good sign for your algorithm if these people are landing in my top left quadrant. The other piece that really drives the conversation in the customer success module is stack alignment. I would love to say this is automated, um, but this is a manual process, but one that people, if they are doing it, are spending hours not updating Excel spreadsheets to get this right. So we let you build your stack of services and then align um, opportunities so that I can see that Hogwarts has a $6,600 a month MRR opportunity and maybe I want to go make a sales call with them. So I can see which services each of my clients has or does not have. And what folks typically like to see is, well, you just said that this was manual, Marnie. What does that mean? So after you build your stack, we let you define which product they have and where the opportunity is. Or if they don't have a product at all, whether they're red, not aligned, partially aligned, they have a product, but it's not your product. Um, or fully aligned. They've got the product you want them to use. If there, if you have any recommendations, you can pull them. They'll automatically come from the VCIO side of the house. And you can then associate that recommendation revenue forecast 
into monthly recurring revenue or non-recurring revenue, like a project cost. And this will drive these three tiles at the top, percent alignment, MRR opportunity, and again, one-time project revenue opportunity. The last piece I'll share on this is goals. Alex and I talked about at the very beginning that the goal for, well, the, the conversation MSP should be having in business reviews should be strategic. It should be about their business, not about, I want to sell you something. How do you make that conversation happen that way? Ask them about their business goals. If this customer told me that they were aiming to expand to a neighboring county, I can think of things I need to do for them right away, some tasks. I can associate to it a recommendation, multiple recommendations, or multiple pieces of my contract that align to that. So imagine if I said, oh, Alex, you wanted to expand to the neighboring county. I have these recommended projects to support that. And these other services that I already provide you are helping you accomplish that goal. They're now seeing you as a part of their business instead of apart from their business because you are helping them accomplish their goals. So think about how strategic that looks and feels. That's the power of aligning the conversation to what the customer is thinking. So I will pause there and see if there are any more chats. Um, again, the customer success module was the one in the middle of the screen. And it is, it does double your cost, right? So you wanna, we always recommend people get their QBR VCIO module going first and then move to customer success. We believe in the MSP space that customer success has a foundation around business reviews because that's where you're building the relationship. Um, so that is how we suggest kicking it off. If you are already a life cycler, if I go into the platform and I go down to account settings and subscription, under the add-on options, you'll see customer success module. You could add that. It will automatically give you a 30-day trial on whatever size package you're on. So you don't have to worry about five or 25 clients, et cetera. Alex, any other questions um, that you want to follow up from or any new questions coming in? that we need There's to a few we can run through. Um, I think I've got everything covered, but um, uh, we, we've had some real good questions. So I want to just run through a couple of them so everybody can hear them if they were paying attention to you and not to the chat. But um, we covered warranty lookups for Apple. Warranty lookup is a potentially a two-way sync out of the box. It does not write anything back to your tools, but it is simply just a checkbox for you to go add that functionality to your um, to your tools. Um, somebody asked about Windows versioning, and I know now you know now that we're into Windows 10 and Windows 11, we have version 1804, 700, a bunch of random numbers, right? But those versions start to have end of life dates on them. Um, we do not pick up those end of life dates and color code red, yellow, or green based on them for two reasons. Number one, most PSA and RMMs are not doing a good job of passing that data back and forth and keeping it in sync. Um, and for the few that are, this is really a help desk problem. If you've got a customer whose operating system is completely upgradable, but your help desk hasn't done the work, that's something that should get caught in a technical alignment, not in a high level strategic meeting with your customer. So we're trying to encourage MSPs to take out of these conversations, those things that could have been a ticket, could have been an email, could have been a phone call, which that could have been handled by any of those three, and turn this customer-facing conversation into a bigger, uh, more strategic conversation. So for that reason, we don't have that, uh, you know, that particular tie-in um, to, to flag based on those dates. Uh, th there may come a day where we decide to do it, but really, even, even if it's uh, you know, an, an expired version of Windows 10, it's just a matter of running a patch and an update on the machine. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think we would treat those the same way as we treat Windows XP or Windows 7. Um, we were asked about SAS, uh, SAS alerts and um, Kruhu. Uh, both of those are on our development roadmap. We don't have hard dates assigned to them yet, but they are ones that we're committed to building. Um, so those are both coming to the platform. Um, we were asked about price increases. And this one, you might know the answer to this one, Marnie. I did not. But um, if somebody has annual price increases built into their ConnectWise or Autotask agreements, do those get reflected in the budget? I don't know the answer to that. I, I think, it, I think the answer is it depends we, on how they're think, built. I Yeah, that would be my guess. <clears throat> we think nightly, right? So we pull over whatever the active 
information yeah. is. And then we're only looking at the active contract. So if their next contract will be, will have an auto increase, we won't see it until it populates. Until it goes active. Yeah, yeah. I think there's some ways where that might fall down just to, just full transparency. We do have some workarounds though. So if you're in that case and you're looking at that and trying to figure it out, either, uh, you know, jump in our discord channel, we hang out on MSP geek a ton, um, or, you know, hop on and have a conversation with one of us on chat on the website or shoot us an email, create a support ticket. One of the 27 ways you can get a hold of us and we'll be happy to, um, you know, walk you through some shortcuts on that. Um, I actually want to give Matt a shortcut for, um, this last one. So Matt, if you want to grab something in particular, across all your clients and update it. You could go into asset ad hoc, grab operating system, type in, you know, grab the exact field that you see. I have no idea how many of these I'm going to get because I've not done this before. I'm going to click save. All right, I can see two records, but it's across all my clients. They both happen to be a Dumder Mifflin. But if these are the ones that are expired, I could multi-select, choose an action and change end of, and change, um, update operating system, or I could more to the point update end of life and make it past due. So if you wanted to do something, so they all showed up red, that would be the way to handle that. Yep. Um, and Matt, I don't disagree with you one bit. Um, you know, we want to be transparent. We want to get this information out in front of our customers, but I do think there are some things, you know, we, we have to figure out where to draw the line. Um, between the old style QBR where we went and sat down with our customer and said, you got 2,741 2, spam emails last, last month and we blocked, you know, 2,000 of them. Um, you know, do we want to get to the level where we talk about every little bit of detail or is there a certain amount of this that is just the obligation of the service department to get it right and we have some service delivery reporting and some SLA reporting that happens in a tool like Bright Gauge or in a tool like um, um, Cognition 360 or something like that uh, versus what we actually take to the client in the high level strategic meeting. So um, it might be two different conversations with the customer. Um, but I, I totally agree with you. They have every right to have visibility into that. We're not trying to hide it. Uh, it's just a matter of when we do QBRs right, we should be looking to have more than just our primary point of contact in the room. Uh, my biggest client at my MSP, we had a CEO, a COO, a CFO, a, um, a director of fundraising, uh, a couple of department heads, and then a bunch of frontline managers. And I would have anywhere between about eight and 11 or 12 people in the room when we did our QBR. I don't want to be talking about version numbers of OSs with that number of people in the room because it just doesn't deliver value to the level of the payroll that it costs them to be in that room with me for that hour. Um, so just give some thought to that. Um, not saying we shouldn't be tracking some of that info. And if you're getting it into your system and, and uh, want to engage with us a little bit deeper on having that conversation, by all means, put in a feature request, um, go down and click on help, create a trouble ticket, spell out the feature request. I, it's not um, not something that's untenable. I mean, it doesn't. It's probably not even that hard for us to build. I will say most MSPs don't collect that data in that good of a fashion. But um, for for those that do, we might be able to to come up with something. So that's just my my take on it. All right. Well, I want to say thanks to all for joining. One last thing: if you're not sure what to do next, if you if you like what's going on there. Um, and you're looking to get signed up, lifecycleinsights.io slash pricing. That's the place you go to get signed up. Um, the, the five and the 25 client packages on that page will give you a free trial. So um, either one of those will, will get you there. If you have further questions, need anything else, info at lifecycleinsights.io. Should get all your questions answered and help you guys get through whatever's going on in your life. Awesome. Well, thank you all. All righty. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Matt, if you need a hand getting through your customer success trial, um, we'll schedule you an onboarding call and, and help you with that. Uh, you can do that here.
you can you can click that link and schedule an onboarding call. Um, just put a note in there that it's customer success onboarding, and we'll uh, we'll get you we'll get you looking at it. There will be a recording for this, Felipe. We'll get that recording out probably end of day or first thing tomorrow, but we'll try and get it out pretty expediently because I know some of you folks are coming in here through uh, through Taylor Business Group and uh, and looking at that group buy um, and some of the some of the discounts for being TBG members. So uh, we got to get you guys squared away before tomorrow. All righty. Thanks, everybody. With that, we're going to we're going to run off to the next things we got to do. Take care and reach out if there's anything we can do to help.